call to worship tonight is from Psalm 98, verses 1 to 3. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Well, good evening again, OEFC. It's lovely to see you and have you gathered here on, a, on an evening tonight where we have got guest ministry. We thank you again, Carl, for, for joining us. And I'll make a, more of an introduction of Carl uh, just in a little bit. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come tonight because it, well, for one reason, it's certainly evidence of the marvelous things that you have done. Uh, you have done a marvelous thing in our lives that uh, these precious people would, would gather on a Sunday evening and they would take time away from uh, the busyness of life and, and gather with brothers and sisters in Christ and, of course, primarily to, to worship you. Thank you for what you've revealed to us, that you have made known your salvation and made it known in such a way that uh, we could not resist its call. And so tonight we want to honor that salvation, that salvation in our midst amongst us and of course in our own hearts and lives. We want to honor that by lifting up our voices in praise. We want to honor that by, by praying appropriately and, and reading your word appropriately and of course preaching and receiving your word for us. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Phil. Well, welcome, Gary, and uh, it's great to be with you again and uh, looking forward to spending this time with you now, sharing something of God's Word. And let's pray as we open our Bibles. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, but as we open our Bibles, let's pray for the Lord to open our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the freedom to open our Bibles without fear of authorities coming in and uh, taking us away, interrogating us. Thank you, Lord, we have religious freedom, and we thank you for uh, this country, Lord, the blessings that we have living here. Lord, help us not to take them for granted. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us now to just appreciate this privilege that we have to come before you in prayer, to praise you in song, and Lord, to seek you in your words. And we pray you'd help us to see there the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to see our need of him, maybe afresh, maybe for the first time. Help us, Lord, to see him as the saviour that you sent and the one that we can believe and follow. Lord, help us to take his beautiful yoke upon us as we read your word and as we study it now. And we ask this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. So if we turn to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 25 down to verse 30. So give you a moment to find it in your, in your Bibles. It is lovely to be here, as I said, and uh, let's uh, see what God shows us in his word. Get to that age now, I need to put glasses on sometimes. <laughs> so here we go, that's better. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. As you can see, the, oh, not quite yet. Um, the, the, the title of the message, there we go, thank you. The title of the message is The Yoke That Fits Well. The Yoke That Fits Well. Jesus says to us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The people in Israel 2,000 years ago were under the yoke of distorted religion. 
In Matthew tw chapter 24, verse 23, verse 4, Jesus, we see uh, uh, there a helpful background as he speaks to the leaders of the day and talking about their methods and uh, the distorted version of the Bible that they're presenting. The attitude and the practice of the religious leaders is summed up like this. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. That's the kind of context in which Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And many people around the world today in a variety of religions are under a similar heavy yoke. Keep the rules, keep the five pillars, follow the teachings of the guru, do your best and hope it's good enough. What a heavy burden that is. There's no true answer. You just do what you can and hope for the best. Ultimately, they are bowed down by the burden of sin, by the burden of, of death, the fear of death, and of course, Satan's deceit. Bowed down under the burden of no real hope, no real assurance. And as Christians, we need to be aware and careful that we don't get, or rather, don't slip into forgetting that we're saved by amazing grace. It's very easy for us to slip back in our thinking, our attitudes to that cumbersome load, to see our walk with Christ as a way that we need to please him, to be loved by him, to be saved by him. Subtly that can slip in. We sing amazing grace, but sometimes we forget that we're saved by amazing grace. Another manifestation of the burden is trying to find rest and peace by feathering our nest with stuff, hoping for the lottery win. I don't do it, by the way. Looking to material things, looking to stuff, to, to better yourself, just to be comfortable or at least satisfied to a degree that life isn't too hard. Working hard to satisfy that inner gnawing emptiness. But all the hopes and dreams are very hard to achieve. They may cost you more than you realize, and they will only last a lifetime at the most. But they don't solve the burden and the weariness that comes from sin and guilt, that separation from God, which we really need. The stuff that we can aim for to get will not satisfy, will it? People are under the burden and weariness. People don't realize it, don't always recognize it. Some people are just trying to survive, to get through each week to Friday, to get through to the end of the working week. People totally unaware that God can transform just a, a survival mode into a life knowing God, a life with hope, a life with peace, a life with purpose, even in the middle of the Monday, even with the, the Monday to Friday. Ultimately, all of us are all under a yoke. But only Jesus offers us the yoke that fits well. Only he offers us the yoke that will bring rest for our souls. I don't know exactly where Bob Dylan is in his thinking, but he did write some wise words years ago. You're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And that's the reality. Who is it? Who are you serving? Whose yoke are you accepting? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the first main heading is this, that it's a yoke of rest to the weary and burdened. Verse 28 says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened. A yoke of rest to the weary and burdened. Now it's not a yoke for salvation, that's very, very important. That yoke has already been carried. That yoke has already been taken. Jesus carried a rough wooden beam up a hill, a cruel yoke that formed part of a cross upon which he was nailed and killed. But of course, a yoke upon which he gave himself to be our saviour, to be our rescuer. 
Now, uh, the yoke that fits an animal, or indeed a human being, uh, to pull a plow or to carry the milk churns or whatever in the olden days, it's designed to fit, isn't it? It's shaped. It's not rough. It's not deliberately hurting the animal or the person. It's not meant to do, deliberately do that. It's not splintered and left rough. The Lord Jesus, though, was soon to bear a wooden crossbeam after he said these words in Matthew 11. A rough and torturously uncomfortable beam that was placed upon an already ripped up and plowed up back as he was there to hang, bearing that yoke, bearing that beam to save us from our sins. And then nailed to that cross, he was to pay for our sins to provide us with the rest of peace, a rest from guilt, a rest from the weariness of striving in religion, but never feeling sure that we're accepted by God. He suffered so that we could have that rest. And so therefore this yoke that Jesus offers us is a yoke of rest. It's a yoke of definitely being saved. Through faith in Christ, we can know that we're saved. It's not a yoke that we wear to strive to be accepted, but instead to rejoice in and to revel in our acceptance and to take on this yoke joyfully. Because I know that as I put on this yoke, as I trust in Jesus, I am saved. I do not need to earn it. And of course, it's a rest available. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. It's a rest available for you if you've not yet come. If you recognize that sense of weariness and burden, that lack of relationship with God, that, that burden from knowing that you have sins unforgiven and don't have that peace with God, there's a rest available for you. Let me ask you, do you feel that uncomfortable agitation because of the things that you say and do and think that are wrong? Your sins, the Bible calls them. Are you troubled by that guilty conscience? Do you feel burdened with the idea that through religion, that you can maybe try to please God, but never be sure? That's a heavy yoke to bear. It's not a yoke that we can bear. Do you feel weary and burdened? Jesus says, come to me. There is a rest for you. It's offered, but of course it's possible to reject. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, it talks about the ancient people of Israel who heard the good news of God in the Old Testament times, but they rejected it. And so the warning comes, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And then verse 11 says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So God offers people rest, forgiveness, peace, freedom of guilt, assurance of salvation. But it can be refused. I want to ask you, I don't know you, uh, many of you, I know some of you, some of you better than others, but you could have been coming here for, for donkey's years. You could have been coming here for the last six months, I don't know, or the last few weeks. But have you repented of your sin? And are you trusting Christ as your Savior and your Lord? Have you accepted this rest that Jesus offers to you? It's available to you. Do not harden your heart. It could be that you've assumed that you're a Christian, you could be coming here many years, and uh, you fit in, and you're loved and welcomed, and you go through the motions and sing the songs and, and join in. I don't know your heart, so I'm not judging you, I can't, I can't, but God knows your heart. Are you here because of tradition, because it's nice people, it's the thing you've always done? Maybe you had some stirrings in your heart in the past, you felt the burden, and, and you heard the invitation, but you, you came, but you didn't really take on that yoke, and... You're here, and you need that rest. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So the Lord calls us to take on his yoke, and that basically means to believe in him. We believe that he's taken that cross beam, that yoke of our punishment, so that we can take on his yoke of rest. We wear this yoke not to be forgiven, but when we accept Christ as our Savior, because we are forgiven, we have the privilege of wearing his yoke, we are saved and we follow Christ. And as we follow Christ, it is under the second heading, a yoke of discipleship. Verse 29, a yoke of discipleship. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the Lord invites us to take on his yoke and learn from me, to be his apprentice to be his disciple and interestingly you will find rest for your souls so we we take on his yoke we find rest in wearing this yoke 
But as we follow him, it, we look forward to finding rest. It's almost as if there's rest that leads to rest. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So basically, the Lord calls us to be his apprentices, his, his students, to be learning from him. Now, my son has recently got a, a driving instructor booked, and it's been arranged by a driving school company. So as yet, they've not met. He's not met. What kind of teacher is this going to be? Is it going to be someone who's a scary teacher? Is it going to be a patient teacher? Is it going to be a very, very wise, experienced teacher? We just don't know. He's got to wait and see. What kind of teacher is Jesus? Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And we go, if you like, to verse, let's look at chapter 12, verse 18. And again, it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Quoting from the words of Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. This is God the Father speaking about the Son. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. This is the kind of teacher that Jesus is. And that's Matthew's comment, by the way, as he's writing his gospel about the Savior that he witnessed, I witnessed himself. We take on his yoke of rest, and we'll learn from him, and we'll discover more rest. There's the rest of knowing that your sins are forgiven. You have peace with God. It's a fact and it's a gift that we receive as soon as we believe in Christ. But as you get to know God better through Jesus, you understand and you appreciate the depth of that rest, the richness of that rest. It's a rest that we kind of experience more and more as we get to know God more and more, as we have a deepening relationship with God as our Father through faith in his Son. And of course, it's through Jesus that we enter into this relationship with God the Father. If you look at verse uh, 25 of um, our passage in Matthew 11, Jesus says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. Now notice this particularly, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We can see there that Jesus, who offers us his rest, his yoke, and to learn from him, he's utterly qualified for us to get to know God as we trust and follow him. It's a bit like having a treasure chest, and the more we take out of this treasure chest, the more we take out, examine, and enjoy what's in it, the more we find there's in there, and we can never exhaust it. And as we enter into the rest of Christ, as we take upon that yoke and learn from him, we discover the depth of the rest and the peace and the joy it is to know God. We see already that Jesus is a, a qualified, a fully qualified teacher. And if you like, the Lord has double authorization and double qualification. He's God the Son. He's the second person of the Trinity. And as the Son of God, he was sent by the Father, and he's been fully approved and appointed to be the mediator. He is the, the gateway for us to get to know God. And no one better could be our teacher. No one better could be our mediator. And of course, as well as being God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, uh, and no one else can know the Father better than him, we also see that Jesus became the God, become human. Utterly known by the Father, utterly knowing the Father, and yet able to link with us as human beings. There's no one better to introduce us to God than Jesus, the Son of God, and the God become flesh who lived amongst us. And also, we, we absolutely need Jesus, we see from these verses here. He chooses to reveal people to the Father, doesn't he? Jesus is that unique teacher and that mediator, and we cannot bypass him. No one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We cannot bypass Jesus. We cannot go any other way. We can't go around him. We can't go over him. All we can do is humble ourselves before him and accept him as our Savior, our mediator, and teacher. And Jesus can teach us so much. 
He can teach us more and more. He can reveal more and more to us as we grow as believers. And so taking on his yoke is a learning adventure. Now, some of you, I don't know, I, I missed out on going to university. You can probably tell <laughs> by my intelligence but, uh, or lack of it. You might have missed out on university uh, or some training that you look forward to. You couldn't get into that, onto that training course, that apprenticeship. You may have felt left out. It might be that in that uh, you know, lineup for choosing for the netball team or the football team, you were always one at the end, near the end. I was probably the last but one. I was kind of not quite the last one because I was a bit big for my age at that time. And I could at least be, you know, block uh, a rugby player or, or block a ball by, just by standing there. But, but um, you know, you know what it's like, don't you, to, to be at the end of the queue, to miss out on opportunities. Jesus calls us, all of us, to be his disciples, to be his apprentices. And he says, here's my yoke. Put it on and let's go places. Sometimes when we go through school, training, work life, it can be really tough. But ultimately, we are all apprentices of Jesus. And there's no better training, no better experience, no better teacher. Let me ask you, have you retired? Some of you are coming towards retirement. Some of you have retired. Some of you, it's many years off. I uh, saw at a kind of pension report the other day, and it said 10 years to my pension. Oh, I, I never, I don't, I don't know whether, what I'm going to do in 10 years time, whether I'll still be, so still be working in whatever form, but you know, it's 10 years until I'm able to get my pension. I looked at how much I'd get each month. Oh, well, I think I'd better carry on working. <laughs> and uh, probably some of you are in that same situation as well. But let me ask you seriously, have you retired early from your apprenticeship with the Lord? Or at least do you think you can retire from your apprenticeship with him? Maybe you're feeling useless. Maybe it's age and you can't do the same things that you used to do. And you're feeling, well, my apprenticeship is over. Or maybe you just got complacent and you reached a plateau in your Christian life. You've overcome certain sins, maybe the big things that people know about, but you kind of plateaued out and you're not really growing in your walk with the Lord. Maybe that's been the case for many years. We don't retire from this apprenticeship. This apprenticeship will continue until that day we pass away and go into the Lord's presence or until he comes for us on that wonderful day. Let me encourage you. To remember that we don't retire from this apprenticeship. There's always more to learn. There's always service that we can give. The nature of our service changes as we get older, as our abilities change, but we never retire. And the, the nature of our training as apprentices of Jesus will change, but we will never retire. It's part of the problem that you thought you could. Let me ask you, are you still growing in grace? Are you still seeking, even as a mature Christian, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Or have you kind of plateaued out in your apprenticeship and think, well, I've been on the road for so long, I'll just tick along until Jesus calls us to follow him as his apprentices, apprentices and we never retire. And thank God we don't, because we can have adventures in our Christian life right to the end until that last day, whether it's a prayer warrior ministry, if we can't get out and about so much. But maybe the Lord wants us to do something, he's calling us to something, to serve him. At the moment we think, well, no, I won't listen to that. I think it's exciting to be apprentices of the Lord. And the third main heading and final heading is this, that this yoke that we take on as apprentices of the Lord, as disciples of him, Jesus describes it in verse 30 as easy and light easy and light. I'd like to examine why the Lord's yoke is easy, why his burden is light, because it sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? It sounds a bit oxy, oxymoron, that's the word, isn't it, I think? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, a yoke is meant to help you to carry stuff, heavy stuff, or pull heavy stuff, and a burden, by definition, is not light, <laughs> because, it, because it's a burden. Well, it doesn't contradict, and it is amazing. It's an it's a easy yoke and a, a light burden, because it's a yoke of certainties. It's a yoke that gives us clear promises and direction. 
It's not if you follow these rules, these regulations, these five pillars, or follow that guru, you may know God, you may be accepted by him, you may get peace with him. It's a certainty. There's a rest. As we put this yoke on, a certainty. We have clear promises and a clear direction to go. We put on a yoke, it's to guide us. It's so that whoever, if it's an animal, the, the person behind, I guess, uh, or maybe someone leading us from the front, can, can show us the way to go. We, we carry this burden, this, this, this yoke, but we, we have a direction, we have a purpose. And it's a yoke, of course, that's because of his love. The powerful, loving, faithful God, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, he offers this yoke to us. So we put on his yoke, and it sounds a contradiction to put on something that is supposed to carry, carry things, and yet it's described as easy and light, but we put it on out of love for the one who first loved us. You know, when you want to help someone and you love someone, a hard, it transforms a hard job, doesn't it? It transforms a hard job into something which is difficult, yes, but it's a delight. We do it because of love for the person. And we put on this yoke because he first loved us and gave himself for us. It's easy and light in the sense that it fits well. It fits well. Now, we know that Jesus was a carpenter in his early life. He was known as the carpenter of Nazareth. And we can imagine him making yokes for animals, can't we? We can imagine yokes maybe made for people to carry milk or water and so on. But he would have made them well, I'm sure. I'm sure he was a, a master carpenter. I remember hearing a, a preacher who imagined that outside the, the workshop of the Lord Jesus Christ is kind of a, the, the selling sign out the front would say, my yokes fit well. My yokes fit well. But Jesus is a spiritual carpenter, isn't he? He fits his spiritual yoke of discipleship uniquely to each of his people. And his yoke will fit you well. It'll fit you perfectly. You can trust him to do that. It's a yoke under which we will attempt great things and achieve things with great and eternal results. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, we see those amazing words. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When you put on this yoke and follow the master, your labor for him will never be in vain. All will work together for good. So this yoke, it's beautifully made. It's fitted for us. It fits well. And it's so that we can be guided and be directed and so that we can pull weight, so that we can be useful in the kingdom of God. It means that we have a direction. We have a we can make a difference and we have a purpose and it's a wonderful thing to take on this yoke to think lord what do you want me to do today how do you want me to live the rest of my life how do you want me to serve you it's also a yoke under which we will suffer for our lord titus chapter 2 3 verse 12 titus 3 verse 12 says this everyone who wants to live a godly life in christ jesus will we persecuted. We take on this yoke, we follow Christ as his disciples, his apprentices, and we will, in one way or another, we will find opposition, persecution. That's not because the yoke is bad, it's made well, it fits well. It's made by the one who loves us. It's made to give us purpose and direction. It's made to enable us to, to serve the kingdom of God and to achieve eternal results. It's not difficult because it's bad, but because the world opposes us and our Lord. Some people will not like what we believe and what we do, and we need to expect that. Jesus told us to expect that. But there will also be joy in the suffering, because we will find, as the, the apostles found, and as believers down through the years have found, the, the honor of wearing this yoke for Jesus and being laughed at, being mocked, being injured, being arrested, even martyred. And of course, in the end, no Christian can be taken away from that love of God and the joy of the Lord. He can only, we can only be transferred even by the worst that humans can do to us, to the, the, the best joy, to be in the presence of the Lord. 
But the reality is, one way or another, whether it's the, the mild, subtle persecution that we experience more in this country, or more dramatic persecution, there will be suffering as we take this yoke upon us. But it's only for a short time, remember? And then what? Then we will enter into our eternal rest. You will find rest for your souls for eternity. And then it's a yoke that limits regrets. Another reason why it's an easy and a light yoke. Because it's a yoke that, although at first it seems to limit us, because you wear something that seems to constrict you, that, that goes around your, your neck, over your shoulders, and it's to carry stuff, it's to pull stuff, it's to, to get stuff done. It, it feels like a restriction. And at first sight, it looks, like, looks that way. You see others around you who appear to be free to do and be whatever they like. Whereas we have a, a restriction, a direction. But in reality, they have other yokes that they don't understand, yokes that are destructive. And the destination, that the, the yoke that they're wearing is towards hell. Our yoke limits us in some ways, but we know it's for our good and it's for our joy. It directs us into the path of righteousness for his name's sake, doesn't it? It directs us in a good way and for our joy. And there's the joy of doing the right things, but there's also the benefit from being kept from shame and catastrophic failure as we are directed by Jesus. Some of us became Christians when we were very young in this room, I guess. And we would say that our testimony is, yes, we were, we were saved the same way as anybody else. We were saved uh, from our sins, uh, our sinful hearts. But our testimony through the years is what we've been saved from, from getting stuck into that other people sadly did, addictions and other problems that other people might have got into. I'm not saying that any of us are perfect by any, any means, but think of the things that you've been saved from because of the yoke that you put on at a young age. And those of us who became Christians later on in life, again, think of whereas we wear this yoke and we follow the Lord, what he keeps us from. He saves us from our sins, from our faults and failings, but also this yoke is to help limit our regrets. Now, we will all let God down and we'll, we will all let each other down. But wearing the yoke of Jesus, we will be saved from many more regrets as we trust and follow and love and obey our master, our leader. It's a light yoke, it's an easy burden, and it's a privilege to learn from Jesus. Who of all the people in the world of history would you rather be yoked to? Who else shall we turn to? The Apostle Peter said when other people, some people were going away from following the Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Would you turn away from the Lord? Who else would you be yoked to than the Lord Jesus Christ? What a privilege it is to learn from him. His yoke, therefore, is easy and light. And also, it's a yoke that makes us beautiful. It's a yoke that makes us beautiful. As we wear the yoke of Jesus, we will learn. And as we learn, we will be changed. And the Bible's idea of learning and discipleship is always practical, and it's always life-changing. If we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, this is what happens as we grow and develop in our discipleship, in our walk with the Lord. 1 Peter chapter, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you met someone and you saw they had grown and developed in mutual affection, is that an attractive quality? If you met someone and you see that they have been growing in love, is that attract an attractive quality? If you saw someone who's been growing in godliness and someone who's a perseverer, someone who's self-controlled, aren't these beautiful characteristics? This is what the Lord wants to develop in us. This is the way that this yoke will change and transform us as we grow and develop in our discipleship, in our apprenticeship 
The Lord wants us to be beautiful people, spiritually beautiful for you men, handsome people. He wants us to be more and more like Christ. We think of the fruit of the Spirit that I mentioned earlier on. Would you like, would you like to be characterized by love, joy, and peace, and patience and kindness, and the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit? This is what this yoke does when we take it on and follow the Lord. And then lastly, it's a, a, a yoke of grace. It's a yoke of grace. If we are free from this yoke that Jesus offers to us, it is apparently more free. There's more liberty to do what we want, but we know really it's a, an alternative. We put on it an alternative yoke that leads to hell. So we might be free from the yoke of Christ, but we're not free. Attached to this yoke, we are under a yoke in, by, in which we are saved, in which we have a relationship with God. And it is a gift that God gives to us. We take on this yoke. We don't have to earn it or pay for it. It's been paid for already. Take my yoke upon you, and you'll find rest for your souls. So what's your choice then? Do you want to wear the yoke of Christ? Do you see him as the one who loved you and gave his life for you? And you're put on this yoke with pride, with a, well, in a, not a sinful pride, of course, but with the joy of knowing that your Savior paid for this salvation. Will you wear this yoke and, and stand up for the name of Christ with a desire to honor him and glorify him? Or will you choose to wear another yoke that appears initially to be, have more of a sense of freedom about it, but ultimately... Is trapping you and taking you to eternal destruction. What is your choice? I urge you, if you haven't made that choice, to take on the yoke and to accept this invitation that you'll do so. The Lord says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And to those of us who have already taken on this yoke and we rejoice that we're forgiven, we, we have we belong to Christ, we're attached to him now. How are you getting on with the apprenticeship? Are you plateaued out? Or are you continuing to learn and to grow? It's a yoke of rest, as we've seen. It's a yoke of discipleship. And it's a yoke that is easy and light because of the one who gives it to us and the blessings this yoke leads us into. Let's give thanks and pray. Heavenly Father, you know whether we have accepted your son's invitation to take this yoke upon ourselves and to learn from him. Lord, you know every heart in this room. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help anyone in this room who has not yet accepted that invitation. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction, that sense of weariness and the burden that sin is and guilt is, and you'd help them by your grace to accept that yoke and be a disciple and an apprenticeship of Jesus, apprentice of Jesus. Father, I pray for those of us who have maybe plateaued out in our apprenticeship experience and journey. Help us afresh, Lord, to recognize the, the joy it is to be a learner of Christ, to be in his school, to be in his university, to be his disciple. And help us, Lord, afresh to seek, to grow in the, these graces and the fruit of the Spirit that we might become people who are spiritually beautiful, spiritually handsome, full of love, joy, peace, and patience, and kindness. Father, we pray you'd help us as we seek to shine this kind of life, as we live it out in our daily lives. We pray, Father, for this fellowship here as they seek to witness for you. We pray for the coronation uh, tea coming up soon. We pray, Father, for the other outreach activities and events, the personal evangelism that goes on week by week, day by day, from members of this fellowship. We pray, Father God, that you would cause this gospel to go out from this place, Lord, to the people in this area and beyond, Lord, and that people would be saved and brought into your kingdom through the witness of this fellowship. Please build up this fellowship, strengthen them, encourage them, dear Father, as they seek to serve you until Christ returns. Father, we ask that you would help us, dear Lord, to take your words seriously now as we consider them quietly.
Heavenly Father, you've heard our words and know our hearts and our responses, and we bring them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just before we finish with a closing prayer, let me say if anyone has, has any questions about the Christian faith, about becoming a Christian, whether you're young or not so young, I'd love to answer them. The Lord saved me when I was about seven, so if you're young, then you can ask me and I can tell you about my story. Uh, and uh, and that, if you're a young person, that would be relevant to you. Uh, if you're older, of course, you can still share what the Lord has done through my life. But there might be other people in this room who you know better than me, who you'd like, like to speak to. But I just really, we've just sung, haven't we? Have you heard the voice of Jesus about what will you do about it? Please don't leave this room tonight if you've got questions or issues that you need to talk through. Let me just uh, close with a prayer from 2 Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Amen. Thank you.